folks, welcome to Uncommon Sense in Current Times. Um, I'm here with uh, Julie Feeling and um, uh, to talk about her, well, well, she wrote a book called um, Beneath Sheep's Clothing and uh, they're about to make a documentary that I know is gonna be released soon. And so uh, Julie, just welcome to the show. And um, I'd like to first just kind of ask you a question on um, just how did, What's the book about and how did you kind of get involved in that in that part of the project? Yeah, so um, it all started with me being a missionary in Russia in the late 90s and um, then coming back to the U.S. And then I went to graduate school and I studied Russian and East European studies and Russian language and literature. And then I ended up writing my master's thesis on underground Christian movements in the Soviet Union and their survival tactics and the tactics of the Soviet state to try to dismantle Christianity. So that thesis, I wrote that thesis in the early 2000s. I actually went back to Russia for research um, to help research and to interview and talk with people um, who have been involved with that. And then I, I set all of my materials aside after grad school. But then in 2008, there was something that happened here in America that was like, it reminded me of what I had studied of what the Soviets did to Christians. I saw a very unpopular fringe Christian movement that's considered a cult which the, the groups that I studied in the Soviet Union were also considered cults. They were the Baptists and, and Pentecostals, and the, the Soviets considered them cults. So it was an unpopular cult here in America that got a militarized raid to their premises and their children taken from them forcibly without due process and uh, just taken from them for their faith. And that was one of the tactics the Soviets used against their unpopular fringe groups. And so I, I was like, hmm, that that concerns me. I took a deeper look and lo and behold, I found all three of the major tactics that the Soviets used against Christianity um, happening in America. And I studied the more sophisticated tactics that the Soviets used post-World War II. Their early tactics of just arresting and imprisoning everyone and then and massacring clergy, that all backfired. It bred a lot of underground um, religious activity. They regrouped after World War II developed a more sophisticated set of tactics. And that's that's what I see happening in America. Although it's even gotten even more sophisticated now here in America, but there's a lot of parallels and it's very concerning. So you were there, you said in the, you wrote your thesis in 2000, you were there in the nineties, but that was right after, I guess kind of, that was right kind of during the, the big changes that was going on with, with Gorbachev is like right after Gorbachev, kind of the, the, the fall of the Soviet empire as it sort of split, split out. Uh, was I was there, there. I was there yeah. um, during Yeltsin post Gorbachev, okay. so 97, 98. So the Soviet Union collapsed like 1991, 92. And um, those early 90s were particularly um, difficult for, for Russia and the former Soviet republics. So it was a little more stable when I was there, but it was still, it was, the society was definitely regrouping still um, when I was there. Did you see a change, a difference uh, from the studies and then what you experienced too of, of what was occurring to Christianity and to the churches um, during, you know, pre, you know, like the 50s and 60s, you know, during the times of obviously Stalin, Lenin, Stalin, and, and, and Khrushchev to fast forward to Gorbachev and Yeltsin and, and what you're experiencing. Did you see a difference there? Because I know a lot of times we talk about communism. The communism was very outspoken and very strong in the Soviet Union, but with Russia, it was supposed to be no longer communist anymore around that time. That's what we were sold. Was there, did you see differences not only in their tactics, but also in their underlying philosophies? Well, when I was there as a missionary, it was, it was not a problem at all to um, teach people about God and to um, have people baptized. So none of that was stuff was going on. I mean, occasionally there were, there were some missionaries that were, arrested for no reason um and there were some other there were some difficult things that happened but like as far as like on a government level um uh, we were totally welcome to be there and um i think we were under surveillance from the K the former kgb but but they didn't we were we were just doing missionary work so but as opposed to looking at what was going on in the soviet union let's say in the 60s 70s and early 80s completely different um what the the three tactics that I studied in depth for my master's thesis um, of how they sought to dismantle Christianity. One, it was something they started right from the get-go, which was anti-religious propaganda, pro-communist propaganda at all levels through society, no other messaging allowed um, within the schools, 
you know, the children are forcibly brainwashed into Marxist, Leninist, communism, um, and um, militant atheist, atheism, um, all of the media, all of the arts, everything has to share that same message and has to glorify the communist state, glorify the, the Soviet leaders. Then you have, instead of persecuting all Christians, what they decided to do is stop persecuting most Christians and only persecute the fringe groups. And so they okay. allowed people into churches that were given an official stamp of approval, the registered churches, and that was the Russian Orthodox Church, the registered Baptist Church, and a few other churches that would abide by certain guidelines. Among those guidelines where you can't bring your kids to church, you can't teach your kids to pray. If someone wants to be baptized, they have to be put on a wait list for three years. They're pretty stringent, wow. strict rules. All the sermons had to be approved by the government. And then the third, we get to the third, wait, a little bit more on that second tactic. The government then only persecuted and only continued to arrest and imprison um, some instances of torture and different things, those fringe groups that didn't register with the government because they wanted to continue to um, exercise their faith according to their own conscience. The third tactic was infiltration of the churches, primarily the registered churches, um, by means of KGB agents going into the seminaries and posing as clergy and then rising up in the ranks in the churches and encouraging the churches, you know, like to go along with the government edicts, all of the sermons approved by the government, the churches become apologists for the Soviet state, et cetera. So those are the three tactics. And yeah, there's all happening in America, not with KGB agents, but with communists though, infiltrating the churches here. Absolutely. So, and, and the first tactic again, say the first tactic again, second one was the fringe, the third one was the infiltration. What was the first tactic again? Anti-religious propaganda, pro-communist propaganda at all levels. So this is the, the takeover of education, media, and the arts and everything. And so, so now the, the parallel to the U.S. that mm -hmm. that, that y'all are seeing. So, mm -hmm. so here, obviously, the first tactic is the the you know the the getting this all in education, arts, culture, you know, every, everywhere there. Yeah. To me, it's obvious, but for those that are listening, it may not be. So, so talk about kind of where do you see is kind of the the biggest area or the biggest areas that 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 they're doing the first tactic here in the United States. Yeah, so I, I wrote most of my book between 2009 and 2011, and I and then I set my I, it's like I had a mental block and could not finish my book, and I set it aside for many years, and I didn't finish it until two years ago, the beginning of 2020, spring of 2022, and I spent the first part of 2022 catching my book up to modern day, and things had gotten exponentially worse. But even back when I wrote most of the book. Um, there were there were concerning things with infiltration of education. I mean, there were cases of kids bringing Bibles to school and getting in trouble, kids getting in trouble for, you know, mentioning God at school, um, can't wear a cross to school in some instances, and just more anti-American um, teachings brought into the schools, pro-socialist, not pro-communist at that time, but pro-socialist teachings. But now, since we've had the woke revolution, the woke cultural revolution in the last few years, I mean, we're just totally out of control with blatant Marxism, everything with the critical race theory, queer and gender theories. Uh, that's what it's all Marxist, a Marxist construct. So Marxism, and people think Marxism, they're like, oh, it's an economic theory. No, it's a, it's it's a playbook to pit a society, get a society, um, the people who can be considered oppressed to go after their oppressors and tear down the systems of power, leaving a power vacuum so that the new power structure, the communists can come in and take power. And so Marxism has been retooled for multiple societies all around the world. They target, they can like retool it to fit the specific culture. And in America, they weaponize our empathy because we are um, largely an empathetic group of people who don't like to see people stomped on. And we don't like that we have a history of oppressing people of color. We don't like that our history of slavery and in America, very few Americans like that. <laughs> like, right, 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 right. Very, very few. And so to they weaponize our empathy to uh, create this white guilt, to create this guilt that now um, we have to allow our society to be destroyed because that somehow redeems us from our past of oppressing black people. Um, and we have to now allow children to cut off their genitals 
um, so that they won't be oppressed anymore by the con evil construct of heteronormativity, where it's normal for men and women to be attracted to one another. So, you know, it's it, first of all, how, do you, how are you defined woke? You know, because obviously it's a it's a good buzz term, um, you know, but but there could be a lot of different definitions of it. I, I um, you know, I, I see as part of one of your tactics, this phrase Christian nationalism that, that I'm sure we'll be discussing here in a second that they use, but people can't define that either. Uh, so how are you defining woke in this particular situation here? Woke is having a having a woke into critical consciousness. And critical consciousness means to view all of society, all of history, all of everything with human interaction through the lens of power dynamics, oppressed versus oppressor. And this, the part, the, the, the thing we have to keep in mind is that there is, that is partially true, that you look at the history of the world and power dynamics and oppressed versus oppressor is a major theme. It is not the only theme, however. And if we put on these, I call them the woke goggles, we put on the woke goggles to see everything through the single lens of power dynamics, then we, we can go off the rails pretty quickly. So, you know, it's interesting. I, I used to be, I used to practice law. And one of the laws that I practiced was dealt with uh, um, employment discrimination, civil rights litigation, et cetera. And, um, and, and it was interesting when you would have people that would, that would complain and they would want to file a lawsuit. So many of them, would would only look at their situation. They couldn't admit that that what they did caused their account. They weren't ever personally accountable. It wasn't the fact that I didn't show up six times. You fired me because of whatever protected class they happen to fall in. Because they can't admit they were wrong, so they had to find some other external reason on why it was. Now there were some a lot of terrible human beings out there that did some terrible things to 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 that that, that deserved to be sued in those situations, but. But I, but I found the majority of it wasn't. Do you think that's part of the problem with culture too, is that the oppressed don't want to be accountable for their actions and and then they make the the oppressors feel guilty? Is that kind of where you fall see that fall in line? Yes, but it's even worse than that because the system is literally stoking the grievance of the quote unquote oppressed classes and stoking them to anger. Oh, you deserve see what those people have? That's what you deserve they should, they don't deserve that you deserve that power and to stoke this anger and so it preys on um the most the darkest aspects of human nature of of envy and um stewing and anger and not being able to forgive and move on and our our young people in our schools all across america I mean, it's not to that obvious extent, except in some cases it is, but the curricula, the social and emotional curricula and the ethnic studies curricula, we, I live in Utah, we have an ethnic studies curriculum mandated to begin being taught in the 2024-2025 school year. And I've seen the curriculum. It is 100% critical race theory and with a little queer and gender theory thrown in there with a little like veneer of, oh, we like different cultures. Hey, let's, how about we study different cultures, which is one of my favorite things to do in life. And how about we leave the Marxism out? <laughs> right, right, right. But, it, but it's training the kids to, it's training the kids with quote unquote privilege that instead of like what a healthy way to look at privilege would be like, I, I'm a person of privilege. I get to look around me and see who can I help lift up. That's a healthy perspective of privilege that a healthy Christian faith, for example, would encourage people, oh, we have, you know, I have a roof over my head, I have food, I have this privilege and that. How can I use what I have to bless someone else? Instead, it trains the kids with privilege to, to have a self-loathing, to see themselves as oppressors. And they get to have a secondary status now to the oppressed, to get to have a higher status and uh, so it's a reverse discrimination. That's what Marxism calls for. It calls for discriminating against the oppressed in the name of lifting up the, or discriminating against the oppressors in the name of lifting up the oppressed. But it always results, every time communism is implemented, it always, we always get the same result. It's never the utopic land of prosperity where everyone, you know, kumbaya together and has everything. It always ends in a bloodbath. The Demas' family has been in the restaurant business for many generations. We have been serving people in the Middle Tennessee market for 34 years. Try our spaghetti kits, our pot roast, which we slow cook for four hours, or our world famous baked chicken and rice soup, which many locals have dubbed Greek penicillin for when you feel under the weather. 
We make our food fresh, and upon placing our order with us, we freeze the order and send it to your house. Demas's is more than a business. Five generations of restaurant operators have taught us many things about food, but more importantly, we have recognized that we don't sell food. We sell the experience of bringing people and families together, which our country desperately needs. So go to DemasFamilyKitchen.com and share in this journey today. And for right now, use the code UNCOMMON to get 10% off of your order. That's DemasFamilyKitchen.com. So, and so you, you think education is, is the number one way in which they're doing it. Do you think, how, how much role does you think Hollywood plays in with the education? And then where... In order for it to get to all the public schools at 50 states that, and that within each district of each state, that's a pretty massive scale that would that, that I can't see how, how someone can organize it. I can barely get five people to meet at a restaurant at the exact same time. So, mm -hmm. so how, how, how does that get implemented on such large scales um, with it? Or do you think it's already instituted before these people start the education process with like said through Hollywood, through culture, through other ways like that? So the infiltration of America's culture making institutions began over a hundred years ago. And it was the specifically communist infiltration of America's churches, of the education, and of media that began over a hundred years ago and we had the long march through the institutions so yeah it sounds like preposterous but by according to um james Lindsay, who is one of my main sources who he has his whole podcast is actually going through primary sources from the thought leaders these marxist thought leaders he says that by 1992 pretty much most of the, the schools of education, colleges of education, and all the universities were captured. And by captured, meaning they're now teaching te the teachers a Marxified education system based on the teachings of Paulo Freire, a Brazilian Marxist, right. um, author of Pedagogy of the Oppressed. So that was already by the early 90s, where now most of the teachers being pumped out are being trained with this Pedagogy of the Oppressed lens. Myself, I have a sister who is a teacher in California, and she she thinks I'm insane. She thinks that she thinks it's just fine, and like she's a good, she's a good person, and I think most teachers are good people. But they have been trained up to see that the social and emotional learning, the ethnic studies, that it oh, it's so nice, like it's a positive, good thing. But what they don't see, and this is what I um, that we attempt to show in the film, Many Thieves Clothing, that. These curricula are designed from the top by entities pouring money in. So the few individuals in these in these social and emotional learning and ethnic studies curriculum um, companies are then pumping these out, especially social emotional learning. It's like 95% of the public schools have the social and emotional learning. And then the teachers are going to their, their trainings to train not just, it's not just like a video you watch, you put social and emotional learning in all the subjects. It's designed to remove Judeo-Christian ethics as the foundational ideology and Americanism, to remove those as the foundational ideologies of America's children and switch it up and insert woke Marxism as the new foundational ideology. And the way they get away with it is because Christianity and woke Marxism, if you just look glancing at them, they both sound like, oh, we're helping oppressed people. What's the difference? There's a big difference <laughs> because with Marxism, there's no limiting principle. You're allowed to murder. You're allowed to tear down and destroy society if you're doing it in the name of helping the oppressed. And that's what always happens. So, and and, and the person's name you remember is James Lindsay. Is that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to look that up. I, I um, uh, looked that up as well. Um, so... All right, so that was kind of the first tactic. Then the second attack it is attack the fringe groups. And, and that seems to be what, what triggered you. You said 2008, you mm -hmm. saw that happen there. So mm -hmm. so that, that second tactic seemed to wake you up a little bit there. Kind of um, uh, talk about kind of the fringe groups. Uh, who are you, who, who is considered a fringe group in this particular situation? Well, in the case of the Soviet Union, I mentioned it was the under it was the Baptists and Pentecostals, Seventh Day Adventists, and Jehovah's Witnesses that refused to register with the Soviet state because they wanted they insisted that they were going to bring their children to their church meetings. They were going to have church meetings that were considered illegal because they had their children there and they were teaching unauthorized doctrines um, like biblical Christianity. 
um, not authorized in the Soviet Union. And they they were subject, there's instances, a lot of it happening, you know, in the in my lifetime. I was born in the 70s, in the mid 70s. You have like Baptist choir master getting arrested and put in the gulag for five years just for being the choir master of the underground or the, the unregistered Baptist church. You'd have, you know, a seventh the, the leader of the underground seventh day Adventist church spending decades of his life in the gulag. And he was rearrested and sent to the gulag at age 84. Uh, of course, he didn't survive that. And you have Christians being sent to psychiatric prisons, um, psychiatric prison hospitals where they were forcibly treated with psychotropic drugs to cure their delusions of God, which destroyed their minds. Um, you'd have children removed from families and put in state-run boarding schools where they lived under atrocious you know, situations infested with bugs and, and forcibly taught, you know, the Marxist Leninist communism, and they were supposed to stay there till they were age 18. And some of the kids would escape and find a way to get back home. Sometimes then the government would come and take them back. And so they did what they could to cut off these unauthorized um, expressions of faith. How does that look in America? Yeah. Um, in my book, I go into two cases, um, the, the Branch Davidians in 1993, and no one likes these particular groups. And I'm not here to say that I like everything about them either. And that's kind of beside the point. No one liked the Baptists in the Soviet Union. They were considered the scum of the earth. They had a lower- yeah, my, my, my in-laws are Baptists. I don't like a lot of them. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, but the branch of idiots. No, I know what you're saying. I mean, you're right. They were, they were they, and they definitely were kind of a fringe group on that, but that was a unique situation, wasn't it? Like, or is there other situations out there like them? Yeah. So one more thing about the Soviet um, underground Christians or unregistered Christians, they had a lower social status than murderers and rapists. So they were literally the wow. scum of the earth. They were hated. Their children were, were beat up at school regularly. They were the, the teachers targeted them. They were mocked relentlessly. There were propaganda films made about them to mock them and they were not able to get good jobs. So they were very poor. They were the only subset, one of the only subsets of Soviet society that, that had a lot of children. Um, so they had large families. They were very poor as, as a result of being poor in large families, they, they were very out of style. So they looked funny. So they were, they were hated. And so comparing the branch Davidians and the, the FLDS, the fundamentalist Mormons, like there is a, it was a similar thing. They were hated more actually in the Soviet Union, the fringe groups. But we have the Branch Davidians in 1993. This was when I was about to graduate from high school. When that happened, I just watched it on the news. I believed everything as it was reported to me. Come to find out that it was very, the story that we were fed, the public was fed, was was very um, twisted. Uh, and when you when you look closer and you research what really happened, um, I'm not a huge fan of everything David Koresh did or said. However, he, they, the Branch Davidians were not a threat. There was no evidence whatsoever that they were going to kill anyone. They And the government ended, essentially, I believe, killed them. That there's, there, there, there's the forensic evidence that there were um, Delta Force soldiers at the back of the building as it was burning that were shooting anyone trying to exit from the only viable exit left in the building after the government had pumped the building for six hours with CS gas, which is, that's even illegal to do in a war against enemies in a war. And they did it against civilians, most of whom were innocent of any crime, children and old people included. Do you think the reason for it was not as, or, or is it possible the reason is not as um, nefarious as, as that of versus, you know, we really screwed up at Ruby Ridge we, you know, we, 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 we killed the Weaver family and it, we were made to look like idiots and we're about to be look like idiots again. And, uh, and, and we were like, okay, we can't afford to have this. So it was more of a cover up than something that was more on the, the aggressive side. Like we messed up, but we can't have another Ruby Ridge. So we gotta, we, we have to cover it up. Is it possible it was more in that direction or is there other evidence out there even since 93 that you're like, okay, no, there, there's, it's, it's a lot more insidious than, than just a one-off. We don't have all the information. However, the, the way this whole investigation was kicked off against the Branch Davidians was due to um, 
a man named Rick Ross with the Cult Awareness Network. And the Cult Awareness Network in the, in the mid 80s had put together a playbook to destroy minority Christian religions. And their playbook was carried out against the Branch Davidians. The Branch Davidian thing, you have the other element with the very hev heavy militarization of it. And that was like the ATF, that was their whole deal. It was a confluence of different things, but the, the Cult Awareness Network was at the heart of how all of this got kicked off against the Branch Davidians. And the playbook was followed where you have the militarized raid on their premises. You accuse them of child abuse, even if you have to make it up, even if you can take maybe one or two things and then you inflate, inflate the claims of child abuse. You find a former sect member to go on the, the media circuit with you and scare everyone um, that they're going to they're going to kill those children. We have to go in now and, and rescue those children, which is not true in the case of the Branch Davidians, and that was literally in their playbook, and to in order to destroy the churches, um, that whatever minority churches they would go after. There's there's dozens of churches they went after like this. The Branch Davidian one was the one that turned out the deadliest, and the most horrific. Um, the FLDS, Rick Ross of the Cult Awareness Network, he was at he was at the genesis of that one as well. And it followed the same pattern, except the, the FLDS were not armed and not putting up um an armed resistance. So they didn't um it didn't go in that direction with them. Right. But it was the same playbook from the perspective of the cult awareness network. Um with there's there's other things with the branch Davidian one, but at at the heart of it, this cult awareness network, and I, there is more research to be done on this. Um, what were the, the intentions of these individuals who wrote that playbook? They're still alive. Well, the man who wrote it, Galen Kelly, is still alive. The woman who funded it, Priscilla Coates, I think she's passed away. Um, so I don't have all that information, um, but it does look strikingly similar to the tactical repertoire of what the Soviets did. And Patricia uh, Priscilla Coates, who funded this playbook, I don't know if she, she was a hardcore leftist. She went to Vassar College. She was in the same class as Jane, Jane Fonda. Does that mean necessarily that she herself was a communist? No, I don't know. I don't know that. So, um, that was that was an interesting little parallel there. I wasn't wasn't expecting that at all. It kind of threw me off. Uh, <laughs> and so, so so I look at it now as part of the, you know because. It was easy, and and at that time I was not a Christian in '93. But it was easy for me, who grew up in the church, but not being a Christian, to look at David Koresh and look at that and be like, okay, yeah, you you are just a cult. You're you're just one step away from Jim Jones. You're one step away from Charlie Manson. You know, and that was so. It was very easy to convince somebody like me. But it, it seems like now, particularly since about 2018, maybe 2016. The, the, the fringe group now is Christian nationalists. It, would you agree? Is that what they're trying to make of the fringe group or those that like it's kind of moved more toward the center as you start to move inward into it? Is that is that kind of part of the tactic as well? Yeah. So and so we, we did another interview, a final interview for our film Beneath Sheep's Clothing with Michael O'Fallon um, and a little bit more with James Lindsay on the whole Christian nationalism Op. It's a psyop. <clears throat> the evidence is that it is a psyop. And the, the, the whole thing with it, what does even Christian nationalism mean? Right. This thing, it can mean like a whole spectrum. Is it is it Christians who are also like America? They, you know, they love America and they're Christian. Are they Christian nationalists? Really and truly, there are a couple of people who it's very interesting. Both of them have the last name of Wolf, who have written books on Christian nationalism, promoting it. And they they are calling for a theocracy, and I think that probably ninety nine point nine 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 percent of America's Christians are not looking for a, a forcible fascist implementation of Christianity. Like we would like freedom of religion. People can choose if they want to, but whatever they want to believe. That's what most of us in America want. But on the far end of it, the ones that are pushing this op, they are calling for essentially a, a theocracy that that would force people to have the right beliefs. So, but then with this loose name, Christian nationalism, it's going to lump everyone in with that. Um, so we have to disavow that term, like normal Christians who, who like freedoms, who like a constitutional republic, need to disavow the term Christian nationalist, not identify with it. And yes, 
um, the people I interviewed for my film who have um, studied this in depth and have met some of these individuals that are at the heart of it, they believe that it is a PSYOP in order to destroy independent Christian churches in America by associating them with this um, dangerous, actually, idea that we should have a theocracy, a Christian theocracy, where people are forced to have the right beliefs. And then and then there would be some kind of like um, event, kind of like a George Floyd type event, where um, some Christian does something wrong and then it gets lumped in, oh, they're all, they're all that. And then, oh, now we have to send FBI agents in to surveil those churches. It's already happened to, to some degree with conservative Catholic churches being um, surveilled for quote unquote domestic terrorism. Right. Um, but if they can associate these independent Christian churches with this, like an extremist movement, um, and this, <clears throat> then they could potentially um, have the government have to go in and surveil them for our protection. And then the only churches that would be left would be the big denominations that are going more with the whole UN one world religion. And that's a whole other topic. I don't go into that in my book because I, that was not part of my research, but it is in my documentary from several people I interviewed. Um, is And it's basically setting up a similar thing to like the Soviet Union, where there is a state approved faith um, that's registered with the church and it's all infiltrated and they're promoting, in this case, it's the one world religion of diversity, equity, inclusion, and sustainability. And the churches would still look like you know, it would still look like there's freedom of religion, but these churches that that promote those globalist agendas, they want to train up their members to be good global citizens. That is a control grid and the churches are being used to push that global government, that communist, fascist, hybrid global government. And then the independent churches are the problem and they have to be nullified and taken out. And the Christian nationalism op could be the way that they do that. You know, it's interesting because, again, I, I'm uh, most of my life I was not a Christian. Again, I, I grew up in church, um, so so I was I was aware of it, but I did not have a relationship with Christ. And but even even then and now, I recognize that forced Christianity goes against the tenets of Christianity. So, in my opinion, it's not really a Christian. So, whenever you take something like that and try to lump it in there, but here's the here's a concern I have, and I guess. You said you encourage people to not call themselves Christian nationalists, you know, so because of getting lumped in. But aren't aren't by doing that, we are acknowledging the fact that is that a way of kind of giving in and, and giving in that step? Or is this something that we ought to say we ought to be able to take a stand on and say, no, this is not what Christian nationalism is. I'm just going to redefine it and still call myself that. Do you do you, or do you think that the, the power brokers are too big to just to run over you if you try to do something of that nature? Because that was it, kind of a tiered question. I apologize. I think it might be better to disavow the term and and to say that that term is a psyop. Okay. And even if people haven't done the research themselves, they could say, "I'm concerned that that is a psyop." And so let I'm not going to associate with that particular name, Christian nationalist. And then follow up by saying, but this is my I'm a Christian system. and I yeah. like I like a constitutional system where we have freedom of religion and people can believe or not believe whatever they'd like. And I believe our rights came from God. I mean. I mean, I know like there was a newscaster recently that was shocked that people would might believe that, but, but I don't know exactly where she thinks rights come from outside of that. So, so they're um, taking they're taking things again. If this is part of the op to take things that many or most Christians believe and then to start to associate it with Christian nationalism so that in the minds of another sector of society, then all Christians are then, right. you know, in that category. And then they're already doing this. They're mixing white nationalism with Christian right. nationalism by, oh, now they're all white supremacists too. It doesn't matter if they perhaps are not white, but they're going to be white supremacists as well. It, it's it's very tricky. We have to, it's, it's tricky. Like how do we stand up, but then not fall in the traps that are laid for us? That's why, you know, the Jesus's advice in the, in the new Testament, we have to be wise as serpents but yet harmless or gentle as doves. I think that that applies here. And um, 
there's a whole other aspect that I haven't even gotten into yet that I go into in depth in my book and also the documentary. That is the literal communist infiltration of America's churches beginning over a century ago. That's also... And that's the third, and that's the third tactic, right? Yeah. 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 And so this began in the early 20th century with um, some big you know, names you'll recognize like Rockefeller funding the infiltration of America's seminaries with literal communists. And you get some really bad characters in there. You have people like that are like founding members of Planned Parenthood and the Communist Party USA that are like teaching in seminaries in some of the most prominent seminaries in America that are then demythologizing the Bible to these up and coming clergy, teaching them that it's laughable that the Bible might be literal, that Jesus, no, Jesus is not a literal son of God. What are you talking about? Th these things being taught within Christian seminaries. So to the point where by mid 20th century, half of America's mainline Christian churches were infiltrated from the top down with communism, with little communists. Well, you know, it's interesting because my, I have two children, both in college. One goes to a public university and one goes to a conservative Christian school. And what I have seen in with both my children talking with them, you know, my 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 daughter who attends a public university does not see a whole lot. There's been a couple little things that's been anti-Christian. It was really kind of obvious, but most of it deals with just kind of the students and their behavior toward toward sex and drinking, et cetera. But my son, what's interesting is, is what's coming out of the program, such as in his first week, they're saying, you know, well, we live in a post-truth world. There's no such thing as truth anymore. I mean, you know, and this is a, but but go to chapel on Tuesday, you know, and um, and then the same thing when I taught at a, at a local Christian uh, university for, for a semester, I taught in the business course and I found that the business students understood the Bible and understood it as the word of God and could practically apply it better than the theology students who were in my class. And the theology students went to more of this approval level of Christianity more than than what the Bible actually says. And like at one point in time, we, were, we I had to write a paper about the parable of the talents. And they all said the master was wrong. And, and from the theology side, not all, but but the, they, many of them said that. And I'm like, you realize the master is Jesus. Like, as soon as you say Jesus is wrong, you messed up. <laughs> you know, but 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 you're right, it, it, it is, and it's much more insidious in the in the in the Christian schools than it was in the non-Christian school that I've seen. And again, that's anecdotal, but it's been interesting watching and listening to my children talk and seeing what they're experiencing with it. I, that does wow. not surprise me at all. That's been happening for a while. Yeah, and then then and in the more recent years, the evangelical churches have been infiltrated. They were they were holdouts for quite a while, but in the last decade, they've come under attack from the top down again. Um, with woke Marxist infiltration. And we see the woke stuff now in all of the major denominations. And um, the woke stuff combined with now the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is again, their one world religion that they want to have. Because they, they realize, the communists realize that they could not do away with religion. And so these global, global entities, so Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum his he has said his his spiritual guide in life was this Brazilian Marxist named um, Dom Helder Camara was his 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 guiding light in this life this this heavily avowed communist there it's very and he has a bust of Lenin Klaus Schwab he's in his office he's got this bust of Lenin sitting on his shelf behind him um, there's very heavy communist influence there. And the UN and the World Economic Forum are are working together to set up this global government. And yeah, they realized they could not do it without faith. And so instead of destroying the faiths, it's to co-opt the faiths. And then the ones that won't be co-opted easily, then you have to destroy those ones. Well, we saw that too during Nazi Germany and during the 30s. You know, there was the confessing church with like Bonhoeffer, et cetera. But so many of them, and what I found interesting is that is that many of the preachers when they were they would they would redefine the the christians that were spoke against nazis they would redefine them as jews and then they would use that as the means of persecuting the jews as it so they just changed the definition of things and and i and i think i seen that as well within uh, within our churches you know of what is love redefining the word love in order to to go along with the, the trans ideology, to go along with critical race theory and intersexuality, all that stuff. 
I, you know, but, but I'm seeing it through redefinition of terms. I, I even had a conversation with a city council member recently over some, some trans parades um, issue, and, and he kept talking about love and love and love. And I just said, what's the biblical definition of love? And it, he froze. He couldn't answer. And I mean, and I know that the guy, I mean, he goes to church. I know he's a very good person, all this other stuff. I don't know where he's going to end up. That's not my decision. But but it was fascinating that he had no idea he could talk about love, but couldn't define it. Um, so 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 is that is that part of the tech? Did you did, did did that happen in the communist, uh, especially in the Soviet Union? Did that happen too of the re, kind of the redefining of terms? I'm just yeah. curious. Oh yeah. Yeah. They would use terms all this, all the time that meant the opposite of what they actually were in real life. And we see that with diversity and inclusion. Yeah. Um, they're really nice sounding words that most normal people would be like, sure, I want there to be diversity, people with different viewpoints, different backgrounds that we can learn different things from. And I'm totally for that. And inclusion. Yeah, we can include, we can, we can reach out and a hand of support to people who are different from us, but that's not what those terms mean in practice. In practice, the diversity means you must have woke critical consciousness or you are not diverse. Doesn't matter what color you are. You, you will, you're, we're going to not include you. We will exclude those of you who do not have the woke critical consciousness. So that's what diversity and inclusion mean in practice. So it's the opposite. And yeah, there were terms like that all the time. I mean, the communists, I'm, I'm not coming up with any comment, any Soviet Russian words off the top of my head, but there, you come across them all the time studying the Soviet history, but the communists often say something that sounds one way and, and it ends up being the exact opposite. They promised in the early days of the Soviet Union, bread, land, and peace to the peasants. The peasants got the opposite. They did not get peace. They got a bloodbath over and over again. They did not get their land. They had to cough their land up to the government who took their land. And if they did not give up their land willingly, they were sent off to the gulag or killed. And bread, well, we had a they had a huge famine there in the Soviet Union that killed off, you know, 20 million or so people. And and the people were not exactly, you know, food shortages are a very common thing that happened in the Soviet Union and in communist societies. So it, you often get the opposite of what they promise. That's a normal thing. Well, based off the history, based off of that that historical context, there, when you look at groups now that are that are supporting, you know, the trans rights or 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 again, yeah. You know, anti-racist behavior, which in and of itself is, is self-defining. It's it's really kind of funny when you when you really read it. Yeah. When you when you see that and assuming they get their way, it, 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 but historically, doesn't it just kind of turn on itself? It, it were these same people that are generally in support of it, unless they happen to be more vicious than others, are they kind of gonna end up being at the bottom with everybody else? Yeah, because communism has, it follows situation ethics where, and as I mentioned before, anything is justified if you're doing it in the name of the oppressed. So it doesn't have limiting principles like Christian Judeo-Christian ethics, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, you know, honor, there's, honor your parents. There's various principles. And yeah, there are some exceptions, for instance, in a time of war, if someone's trying to kill you and your family, Right, right. Most Jews and Christians believe that it's okay to act in self-defense. But with communists, it, it, there are no limiting principles. And so the psychopaths tend to get in charge. And the psychopaths tend to climb the ladder very quickly. And the psychopaths don't like other people being a threat to their power. I mean, so Stalin, for instance, when he got in power, he instituted the, the great purge of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union and killed off a million loyal communists because as enemies of the state. And, and maybe some of them would have been a threat to his power, but they were loyal communists by and large. And they got into that meat grinder, you know, arrest, execution, off to the gulag to you. Um, and you see that over and over again, that, you know, it's a power grab. Communism is a power grab, but under the guise of, of uplifting the oppressed. It never uplifts the oppressed, <laughs> like it yeah, says. Yeah, I mean, same thing happened in China. I mean, with Mao, with the you know the Cultural Revolution, it was the exact same thing. You know, he 
it started out where he wanted to, to do this. And then when they started having problems, well, I'm just going to kill off all my rivals and uh, kill off all the people that supported me and, and, and moved from there. What, what, all right. So I guess in, in, in you, you 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 have this the the, the book and the, the movie when's the movie coming out by the way when, when's the when, when's that coming out our online premiere will be may 23rd okay all right so really soon really soon so i'm excited to excited to see that mm -hmm. so people see this they or they read your book or they, and, they, and, and or they watch when they watch your movie um so what so i, I learned this stuff and i'm like yeah you're absolutely right and I'm going to get on social media and I'm going to say how terrible it is that schools do this. And then I'm going to go about my day and I'm going to go to Walmart and, and buy my groceries and go home and watch TV. I mean, what, what, what can we do? What does the average American do after seeing something like this? Because many of us think, well, I don't, I, I don't have any influence. I don't have any power. So I'm just going to allow somebody else to do that, which is part of how it, it, we, we run into this problem. So what's your recommendation? Like, what's the steps and the takeaways they can get from this? Well, I mean, my book has a chapter on solutions at the end and our film Beneath Sheep's Clothing has about 15 minutes at the end of solutions. But really and truly, there is much more detail that is needed. And so we're actually putting together some um, very detailed trainings for people. And we're going to start with churches and schools. Um, I don't feel like I have control over what Hollywood produces. Other than like, I'm not going to pay money for certain types of media and I, I don't even have TV channels at my house. Um, we don't, I don't have cable or anything. So other than that, I don't really have control. I feel like I have very limited control as to what our leaders in Washington do, but we do have control over where we send our children to school. I have a nine-year-old son who I'm choosing to homeschool. Um, and homeschool is one very viable option for many people in order to protect their children from this indoctrination. There, there's more to it than that. Um, as far as what the church we can do as Christians, um, we're going to, we're going to be, um, we are in the process of collaborating with people who have boots on the ground, who have had successes in these various areas to equip people with, with very detailed strategies and see, I don't know what your role is or what this person over here, what their particular role is. That's something that we have to really look within to find out what our specific role is. But I do think we need to protect ourselves and our children from indoctrination. And if, you know, for some people, they might go to school board meetings and speak out. I've done some of that myself. Other people might run for a local office uh, or a state office. Other people might try to raise the, the you know, raise a warning within their church congregation. Maybe some people won't like that, but <laughs> it's, right. Um, but so, but we're gonna we're we're putting together these education modules to give people those very specific strategies and to hear from people having successes. And really and truly, it's it comes to our state government and our local uh, city and county governments that we have more control, and we need to take those back. Of course, we hope we can take back Washington, D.C., but I'm not really sure. I mean, that will take an act of God, probably, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, um, and I don't think people realize how much we're impacted on our day-to-day -day lives more from state and local than we are federal. Unfortunately, we watch CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, which only covers you know, the larger things. I think we lose sight of the little stuff that impacts us on our day-to-day -day lives. I think COVID should have been a big wake-up call that we need to look at our state and local a lot more than federal. But but unfortunately, it seemed to do the exact opposite, which is, again, keep us distracted up there. Because, I mean, there, you had states like Florida and even Tennessee compared to California and Washington State. I mean, it was it's a world of difference of, of you know... Me being able to evangelize here in Tennessee is tremendously simpler than me being able to evangelize, say, in Seattle, Washington. I mean, I, I just I think people need to be a lot more involved in that local. I'm really glad to hear you say that because it's just and again, whether you run for office, I'm not a fan of that. I, I'm a person not electable, so it doesn't matter. Probably I'm not a fan of it, but but nevertheless, we 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 still got to get involved in it. I think it's critical. So I'm glad to hear you say that. You can support good candidates and and work to vet good candidates, and um, that yeah that and and everyone has their different role. Um, so yeah, so we're we'll have those trainings available. Um, 
um, we'll have the, the education and church training modules available for people by the time the film is out in May, May 23rd. And then our plan, our hope is, is that we can continue and put out a different one every month, um, how to take back uh, one's local government, how to be um, to operate within your state to get certain legislation passed. And then, you know, getting interviews with people who are having successes in Tennessee or in Florida or wherever the case may be. What did they do to, to get that success? How did they, how did they, you know, rally support for that? Um, what tactics seem to work? There, there's a book called, um, is it called Beautiful Trouble? And it's basically Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, part two. It's the modern um, Marx, Mar Marxist communist playbook for how to um, destroy society for activists on the ground. And it gives them like step by step. It gives them case studies and all the details. And I'm hoping that that um, myself and a good friend of mine working together to put this movement together to go with the documentary and the book. Um, that we can be kind of like the opposite, like the anti-communist pro-freedom playbook that where we can um, work together and we can get people activated because there's more sane people in this country who just want to live in freedom and peace, you know, on, on whatever side of the aisle than there are of the of the far left or even the far right crazies. There's right. way more sane people. And if we band together and we become activated I think we can do a lot, but we really don't have much time. We've got to get this moving now because we're in the end stages of this of this Marxist revol cultural revolution here. And once the culture is gone, right. politics follows. So, well, I I thank you very much for for what you're doing. I love the fact that you have a plan. I I think that's that's awesome with it. Um, uh, to to learn more about it, where where do people go? How do they find out more about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go to beneathsheepsclothing.movie. And um, right now we have the intro of the film up there. It's two minutes long to watch. We have a new trailer coming out next month. And we'll have like different scenes and stuff that we'll be putting out. People can get on the email list. Um, there's a link to buy my book from there. But go to beneathsheepsclothing.movie and um, everything that you need is there. So good. Well, again, thank you so much. I do appreciate you get not, not coming on the show, but just just really what you're doing. I, I think that's it's it's amazing, and um, because yeah, we have to wake up, um, and and Christians have to wake up. I, I think the the 20 years ago Christian Christianity is not going to work anymore, and we have to we we should have woke up then, but but it's too late now for that. So we have to start doing something now, and I think we 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 must do something. So I thank you for helping kind of spur that on and encouraging people to be more bold. So I, I thank you for that. No, thank you. I appreciate it. In Acts 5, we see that when Peter and the other disciples were ordered to stop talking about Jesus, they responded, we obey God and not man. In 2020, we saw something we never thought we could see in this country. They shut down our churches. After decades of removing God from schools and public institutions, they went straight at our community. Unfortunately, we as Christians did not know what to do, and even worse, we chose to listen to false prophets masquerading as Christians on how to respond. I recognize this is the only beginning, and we need to know how to respond. We have a duty to say no to unjust laws, but as Christians, we have a greater duty to God. In my book, On the Duty of Christian Civil Disobedience, I use biblical teachings to help believers know when and how to stand up to those in charge when they ask us to commit evil. You can go to peterdemas.org to find out about our duty to say no. And when you type in the code UNCOMMON, you can get 10% off your order. That's UNCOMMON at peterdemas.org. Remember, we are to obey God and not man. One of the things that, that, that Julie said I thought was really fascinating, she says that we weaponize our empathy. And I think as Christians, we, we get so caught up in trying to understand you know, what love is and what we should do and not do and how we should say it. And we're looking at a worldly form of kindness. But the problem is, is that we're looking at non-Christians giving us the definition of what, what love is, what acceptance is, what being a good neighbor is. We're looking at these things instead of looking at what the Bible actually says about it. And because we are either, because uh, we're either lazy or because, again, we're, we're being empathetic, we're, we're not finding out exactly what the Bible says and responding in such a way. 
we have a duty to stand up. We have a duty to speak out whenever something is happening. And, and this is a prime opportunity of it. As, as you see, the, the tactics that are occurring have been occurring for many, many years and recognize that God put us here for the season. We are the 21st century of Acts. The Acts didn't finish when the, when the chapter ended. It continued as the church continued to grow. And if we're the church, we have a duty to respond and we have a duty to act. And therefore, we need to be able to do so because, again, God put us here for a reason. What's the reason for you? Your circle of influence may not be as large as some people. It may not be as large as some of the people on the other side that we hear and we, we see, but you do have an influence. Your influence could be at the local government level. Your influence could be your family and teaching your family the foundations and the fundamentals of the Bible, just so that when time comes that we can be able to stand up and show people what the love of Christ really is, to show the light that's there. So I encourage you to, 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 to read this book. I encourage you to, to watch this movie and, 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 and move forward from here because it, it, we need to understand the tactics of the other side so that we can be better prepared. If we aren't prepared, we're going to end up behind the eight ball and it's just going to catch us off guard and we're just going to be able just to complain and there's nothing else that we can do about it. Speak out, encourage other people, talk to other people, be bold, not belligerent, but know the tactics of the enemy. So like the program, um, follow, subscribe, uh, uh, contact me um, in any way. Even if you just need prayers, kind of go through my website, which is peterdemas.org, and, and, and reach out to me there. Um, and um, be, be more than happy to, to, to pray for you. Um, and, and just, again, want to encourage us to be able to stand up and speak out. So, again, I thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you next week.